Good evening, everybody uh, here at the Tavern and also online. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Scott Dwyer. I'm executive director for Sons of the Revolution, the state of New York and its Francis Tavern Museum. Uh, welcome to another evening lecture here at 54 Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan. Uh, remember, if you are joining us virtually and you have questions during the lecture, uh, please leave them in the Q&A box. Uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A uh, during the lecture, so don't worry about uh, saving your questions to the end. Um, if you're joining us in person, thank you so much. Uh, you'll be able to ask your questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, remember, the views of the speaker are their own and do not re necessarily represent the views of Sons of the Revolution in the state of New York or its Francis Tavern Museum. Uh, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Brooke Barbier is a public historian who received her PhD in American history from Boston College, specifically researching Boston's social, social and cultural life during and after the American Revolution. Uh, while earning her graduate degree, she taught history at Boston College and Stonehill College. Uh, two of Brooke's favorite things are history and beer. So in 2013, she founded Ye Old Tavern Tours, uh, which offered tours of um, Boston's historic sites and taverns. Uh, she is the author of two books about revolutionary Boston and has been interviewed by the New York Times, Boston Globe, Boston Herald, and Boston.com. She is, she is originally from San Diego, California, but has lived in Boston for many years. Please join me in welcoming Brooke Barbier to the podium. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me, Francis Tavern. Thank you, guys. I just saw someone in the audience I wasn't expecting to see. Hi there, Kelly. Um, hi to you online. Thanks for um, tuning in online and for all of you guys in person. I'm so excited to talk to you guys tonight. But before we get into it, it's only appropriate that we toast the way Hancock and his contemporaries would have. That's those who have joined Yield Tavern Tours before know that it's going to be, we're going to begin with a hearty huzzah. That's H-U-Z-Z, -Z. well, it's spelled right there, A-H. For those of you at home, I hope you're drinking something too. On the count of three, we'll do a hearty huzzah. One, two, three, huzzah! That was marvelous. So let's start with something as true today as it was in the 18th century. Alcohol brings people together. It loosens usual behaviors. It builds community and a shared identity. And while we might not associate alcohol with the American Revolution today, John Hancock certainly would have. He drank a fair amount and also treated others to drink. He entertained in his home and in taverns, and all of this led him to build his social influence until he became the most popular man in Boston and Massachusetts. We're going to also see tonight the way that alcohol influenced the American Revolution in some pretty surprising ways. So if you are drinking tonight, you can feel good that it's a historic and revolutionary activity. Let's begin with a brief background on John Hancock. Americans know him today for having the first and largest signature on the Declaration of Independence. But few Americans know much beyond that. And even Hancock would have, when he was a young boy, not expected much from his life until his life changed when he was just seven. His dad died and he went from living with his mother and father to living with his wealthy paternal uncle, Thomas. Thomas had amassed the largest fortune in Boston in a single lifetime. He was a merchant importing and exporting goods, and he adopted John Hancock as his own son. Hancock's life fundamentally changes again when he is 27, Thomas dies, and all of the uncles in significant business holdings go into uh, the hands of John Hancock. Overnight, he becomes one of the most prominent men in Boston. A man of his new elite status had certain social obligations. Elites were to show noblesse oblige to what people in the 18th century referred to as the lower orders or sorts. And I'm gonna be using that term today. Lower orders and sorts, I want you to think longshoremen, sailors, apprentices, artisans. 
And one episode, um, we see people, elites, primarily treating the lower orders on election day. This was a common practice. And George Washington learned the hard way that you should treat people to alcohol. When he first ran for political office in Virginia, the very first time he lost. When he ran a couple of years later, he spent an enormous money on, on alcohol and he got elected. Now, Hancock didn't just treat on election day. His house was so accustomed to visitors that servants made a uh, rum punch every morning and placed it inside the front door for visitors to enjoy. Hancock is also different than other elites because he seems to genuinely like connecting with all kinds of people. Account after account says that he was good with people. One observer said of him that the way he talked to people made you think he was talking to his, quote, brother or relative. Now, also treating alcohol uh, inside your home doesn't help to, doesn't hurt rather to loosen people up. One example from his early life in 1763 shows him finding his way with the lower orders. Hancock had a pair of shoes repaired by a man named George Hughes. I have a picture of George Hughes, but it also comes with a warning. I'm talking about a story with George Hughes from 1763, and this picture is from 1835. He lived a long life. So just know that the picture I'm about to show was not he, he, I'm talking about a young man. Um, so George Hughes was a shoemaker, which was one of the loneliest positions in colonial America. And he repaired a pair of Hancock shoes. Hancock was pleased with the work and invited Hughes to come over to his mansion on New Year's Day, a tradition of the wealthy to offer your well wishes. Hughes was nervous to go, but he did. Once inside the mansion, Hancock greeted him warmly and indicated that he recalled their er earlier interaction. Hancock was just five years older than Hughes at the time, again, not in this picture, but they seemed worlds apart. They both understood and accepted the 18th century social order that placed an elite educated gentleman like Hancock on a higher plane than a shoemaker like Hughes. They both had roles to play. The shoemaker was to bow and show humility, while the elite, Hancock, was to project superiority and perhaps charity. Hughes stammers through the reason for his visit with a prepared speech. Very well, my lad, Hancock says, and invites him to have a seat. Hughes does not sit. He remains nervous, quote, almost to death, as he described. But then Hancock does something very smart. Now, it's easy to un understand Hughes' discomfort being inside the Hancock mansion. We only have a picture of the mansion from much later after Hancock has died, uh, but inside the home. Hughes he is in this mansion with richly decorated, uh, that is richly decorated, and it's being tended to by servants and overseen by a man wearing a powdered wig and gilded clothing. The differences were so visible and obvious to both of them. But Hancock is able to put Hughes at ease. First thing he does, he reaches into his breeches pocket and pulls out a coin and gives the coin to Hughes, thanking him for coming. The second thing he does, you got it, he sent called his servants to bring out wine. The two men ticked glasses and they shared conversation until Hughes had decided he was ready to go. Hancock again thanked him for coming. And uh, Hughes would Hughes went on his way. Hughes was one man, but we see Hancock finding his way with more of the lower orders just a couple of years later. This is where the familiar story of taxation without representation and the resistance and rebellion against that comes into play. So in 1765, Parliament, England's governing body, passes the Stamp Act, which is a tax on printed goods. There are two violent protests against the Stamp Act in Boston, targeting two royal officials, Andrew Oliver and Thomas Hutchinson. These riots were shocking in their violence and the, in the one against Hutchinson in their totality. And Hancock was nervous that more violence might break out on the day that the Stamp Act was to go into effect. 
So he and another merchant decided to bring the lower orders together. These were the men who were comprising the mobs and try to convince them to act respectably. They host a party at a local tavern. There was no shortage of watering holes in the hard drinking town of Boston. That is a legacy that continues in Boston um, of being hard drinking. But colonial taverns were places where men gathered for camaraderie, debated politics, and built connections. And sometimes in colonial taverns, oftentimes you could also have a place to stay in a colonial tavern. Although you typically in the colonial era didn't see elites at the same taverns as those from the lower orders. There were different taverns that um, others might have felt more comfortable in. But Hancock chose to entertain at a tavern familiar to him and uh, familiar with uh, popular with artisans. The Green Dragon Tavern had been around for a century and was a large brick building. It got its name from the Copper Dragon sculpture, which you guys, let me try out this pointer. I'm afraid I'm going to, oh yeah, look at that. Okay. Um, you can see the dragon there, but I have a close up for you. It was a copper dragon sculpture that extended out from the front of the tavern and oxidized, turned green, became known as the Green Dragon Tavern. The upstairs of the Green Dragon at the time had recently become home to a Masonic chapter that John Hancock belonged to, as did Dr. Joseph Warren and silversmith Paul Revere. That night at the Green Dragon, Hancock was a generous host, as he would be throughout the throughout his life. He paid an enormous sum of money for food and drink and gave a speech at some point, convincing everyone to act peacefully going forward to demonstrate their uh, to demonstrate peacefully. Hancock's plan worked. On the day that the Stamp Act was to go into effect, there was a much more festive atmosphere in Boston. And ultimately, the Stamp Act was repealed just a few minutes, few months later, never having been collected. But Boston wasn't going to miss out on the Stamp Act repeal celebration. So they threw a town-wide party. And once again, <laughs> Hancock didn't want to miss out. So the town party centered at Boston Common. That's a public park that's the same name if you guys have been there in Boston today. Uh, here it is, and then the arrow at the top points to Hancock's mansion. So the party was happening at Boston Common, but you see that Hancock's mansion is at the top of the hill. It's essentially right in front of Boston Common. So it gave Hancock a chance to show off. He illuminated all of the windows in his home, which drew townspeople's eyes up to him. And he hosted a party for the genteel of town inside his home. Even as he entertained the, the, the elites privately, he didn't forget the masses outside. To them, he gifted an oversized pipe of Madeira. Pipe is a barrel that's usually about 120 gallons, an enormous um, barrel of wine. Madeira is a fortified wine from an island of the same name, and it was subject to significantly higher costs. So most men from the lower orders and women wouldn't taste Madeira on the regular, uh, but be, unless they were being gifted, gifted to it, uh, gifted it by Hancock. One person who was enjoying the gifted Madeira that day, George Hughes, very, uh, yeah, he comes back, back up again. He's enjoying Han Hancock's hospitality for at least the second time that we know of. Uh, one newspaper account said that Hancock was down out in front of Boston Common around the Madeira, treating every person, quote, with cheerfulness. He also paid for a fireworks display that evening. Now, just to be clear, Hancock gets something from this too. He gets admiration and affection from a group of people that he so desperately wants through his life. So while he is in, he enjoys the company of others, he enjoys also the way that it makes him feel. Hancock served Madeira that day, and it was a favorite of his. He was exacting when ordering it. Check this out. He says, when ordering it in a letter, I don't stand at any price. Let it be good. I like a rich wine. Yes, this is a man who knows how to order what he wants. But this love of Madeira leads to one of the most memorable mobs of the American Revolution. And it gets, I mean, he gets into trouble and it leads to one of the most memorable mobs. We need a little bit of context. 
1767, a, t a customs board was established in Boston to enforce a new tax. So the Stamp Act had been repealed in 1766, but Parliament passes a new tax in 1767 on imported British goods, and then they set up this customs board. If the custom if the customs board was bad, the tax was worse. Bostonians just found this to be replacing one bad tax with another bad tax. But the feeling of disgust between customs officials and Bostonians went both ways. The customs officials found Bostonians to be disgusting because of their very permissive attitude toward smuggling, and they were determined to stop it. Who better than to target why one of the most popular men in Boston and a very prominent merchant, John Hancock. If they could get him, that would really send a message about smuggling. So in the spring of 1768, two tidesmen, I'm gonna use that term a couple of times tonight. It is the term for the customs officers who regularly boarded the ships, collected taxes, roamed the wharves. So two tidesmen named Owen Richards and Robert Jackson go down to Hancock's ship, one of his ships one night at his wharf. And actually, let me show you guys this. So this is a map of Boston in 1769. And uh, you can see Hancock's wharf jutting out. Not everyone was wealthy enough to have a wharf named for them. That um, There was a handful of merchants who did, but you can see Hancock's wharf there. By the way, what's so cool about this map of 1769 Boston is you could use it in 2023 Boston. I wouldn't recommend it but some of the streets and landmarks are the same, uh, which, which is really special. So Owen Richards and Robert Jackson, these two nosy tidesmen go down to Hancock's wharf and board one of his ships. And they're hanging out there for a couple of hours before Hancock gets word and he arrives and he asks Richards what he's doing on board. Richard says, I'm just performing my duty as a customs officer. And Hancock says, you can stay above deck, but you cannot go below deck where you were. Then he tells his crew that if anyone lets either of them below deck, they'll be fired. Now, Richards and Jackson aren't deterred by this at all. They return to Hancock's Wharf the following night, and they board the ships, and they're there for a couple of hours. Again, Hancock gets word, brings him and some of his servants down, and they demand that Richards come above deck. Richards refuses. This goes on. And then Hancock finally sends some of his men below deck to grab Richards. Only two are necessary. They pick him up. Each, they each grab an arm and a leg and haul him up and dump him in front of Hancock. Hancock publicly berates Richards, telling him that he had no right to go below deck. Now, a crowd is gathering around so excited that someone is standing up to these hated customs officials. After Hancock is through with Richards, the crowd wants to huzzah Hancock home, escorting him along the way. Hancock turns, turns that ex escort down. By the way, Richards is going to, <laughs> he's going to continue to annoy Bostonians. A few years after this event, this is, this is wild. He gets tarred and feathered while 2,000 Bostonians look on. You've heard of tarring. Yes. Now, if you guys think that's something, you, that's not even the punchline because they did something quite rare. After tarring and feathering Richards, they set the feathers on fire so the skin underneath would burn. And Richards would survive, by the way. So uh, Richards had, had built up some bad will in Boston. Hancock's public swaggering display, however, also builds up bad will amongst the customs officials. They are determined to get Hancock for something because he has now just berated their tidesmen and undermined their ability to do their work. So a month later, Hancock's ship called Liberty, that's gonna be kind of funny in a second, um, arrives at Boston Harbor and docks at his wharf. Um, it comes in from Madeira. That's the island that is where Madeira wine comes from. This engraving comes from 1768 and it's done by Paul Revere. Um, and it's really to show the troops arrival in Boston, but I like it because it's a sort of stylized version of Hancock's Wharf. So Liberty docks at Hancock's Wharf and declares that there's 25 casks of Madeira on board. The tidesman, Thomas Kirk that day, accepts that number, taxes are paid, 
and everyone goes about their business. Except Liberty could hold more than double that cargo. And it seemed very unlikely that an experienced merchant like Hancock would sail across the Atlantic with his ship at less than half capacity. So the customs commissioners questioned Thomas Kirk and Kirk says everything was on the level. And then a month, then a month later, he changes his story. And he says, okay, remember when I said everything had been on the level, I was lying then. And now I'm ready to tell the truth. And here's the truth. On the day Liberty docked, the captain, John Marshall, asked me to look the other way while he smuggled goods. Flat out, this story starts with John Marshall, the captain, asking a customs commissioner to let him smuggle. This is so not believable. By the way, the reason that Thomas Kirk felt comfortable coming forward with this incredible story is because John Marshall had recently died. And he had been afraid of John Marshall. And now he said, okay, now I'm going to tell you what John Marshall really did. So when uh, Kirk refuses Marshall's request to smuggle goods, Marshall takes five or six men and they lock Kirk below deck in a cabin, nailing it shut. For three hours, Kirk claims to hear the noise of the tackles and the hoisting out of goods. And then it goes silent. The cabin door is pried open and filling the doorway is John Marshall. He tells Kirk that if he breathes a word about what he saw or heard that night, he and his property would be harmed. This story is the work of an imaginative mind, but it does what it needed. It implicates Hancock. So two customs commissioners go down to Hancock's wharf ready to seize Liberty. Now a crowd gathers is gathering around at this time. Little else but a hint of wrongdoing by customs commissioners would cause a crowd to gather in Boston, but especially in defense of Hancock. So the crowd is growing in number and they are warning those customs commissioners that they shall not seize Hancock's ship unless they wanna be chucked into the harbor. The customs commissioners are undeterred. They seize Liberty, brand the mast with the King's mark and haul Liberty over to Romney, a British warship hanging out in Boston Harbor, and they'd secure it to Romney. The townspeople erupt. They throw stones at the customs commissioners. They hit them with clubs and brick bats. A son of one of the customs commissioners who wasn't involved in the seizure was also overrun. They dragged him by the hair through the streets as they hit him with dirt and beat him with sticks. All of that's a lot. But then the mob was now numbering between 500 and 1,000 people. And according to the royal governor, they were fueled by rum. They take it one step further. They drag a sailboat built by one of the customs commissioners out of Boston Harbor. They haul it through the streets of Boston up to Boston Common, where they set the boat on fire. It was a stunning display to defend Hancock's right to smuggle wine. But this riot doesn't solve the problem of the Townshend duties. And so they, uh, Boston works legislatively to try and impact, uh, to try and nullify the Townshend duties. Ma the Massachusetts House of Representatives sends a letter called the Circular Letter to the other North American colonies asking them to boycott British goods until the Townshend duties are repealed. The royal governor of Massachusetts is furious at this insolence and demands that the House of Representatives repeal this letter. They said they'd put it to a vote. And not surprisingly, they vote overwhelmingly not to rescind the letter. 92 men vote not to rescind, 17 vote to rescind. 92, the 92 men includes Hancock and they became known as the glorious 92. Paul Revere creates, silversmith Paul Revere creates a punch bowl honoring the men and the moment. By the way, those of you that are drinking wine or beer or anything tonight, in fact, you can be glad you're drinking from an individual vessel because in the 18th century, the punch bowl that Paul Revere created would simply be, you would drink it from your lips and then pass it to the next person and raise it to your lips. Um, and that's uh, how it went. So this punch bowl this is so special. It survives today. And you can go see it at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Hancock was there at its unveiling 
and likely drank from likely drank from its rim and huzzahed. Toasting, as we started our talk tonight with, was a common occurrence in colonial America. Toasting was a way to build fun and unity, but it, and it was such an ingrained practice that when Massachusetts passed a law banning toasting in an effort to limit consumption, so um, targeting something that wasn't really the problem, it was repealed six years later because it was utterly ignored. Too many huzzahs, though, and parties might get out of hand. Hancock paid for this, literally. Hancock was the colonel of the Corps of Cadets, which was Boston's militia group, mostly ceremonial in nature. This role was perfect for him because it gave him a chance to socialize and be generous. Training days often ended with the men drinking, to, and, drinking and eating together. Hancock foot the bill for some of these parties, and one of them survives. He paid for over, I, I don't expect you guys to fully be able to read it, but he paid for over 100 bottles of punch, sherry, and Madeira. And as fit a raucous party, a couple of bowls and glasses were also broken, and he was charged for those too. Now, protests continued through the 1770s, most famously with the Boston Tea Party in 1773. The 200 and 50th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party is happening this December 16th, by the way. Boston is planning a lot of events around that. And the Boston Tea Party is what gives my book its name. My book is called King Hancock, and it comes, we first see that name appear in print in 17, or first appear in the historical record, rather, in 1774. Here's what happens. British soldiers were occupying Boston, and some officers kidnapped a Bostonian and were demanding to know who ordered the destruction of the tea. That's what the Boston Tea Party was called at the time. Who ordered the destruction of the tea? This man, Samuel Dyer, says, nobody. And the British officer shouts in his face, you're a damned liar. It was King Hancock and the damned Sons of Liberty. And that is the first time we see this nickname, King Hancock. It's very clever. It captures John Hancock's popularity in town, but it also is a is a condemnation of Boston's lack of an aristocratic ruling class in that King Hancock, the best they could do for a king was having John Hancock. But then something extraordinary happens. On April 19th, 1775, the Revolutionary War began with the battles of Lexington and Concord, about 15 and 20 miles respectively from Boston. The British have a really tough time in Concord, and they're deciding that they need to retreat out of Concord. The problem with retreating out of Concord is there's only one road home, and colonists had lined up on this road and were firing at the soldiers from behind walls and inside homes. So it was so bad for the British soldiers because they couldn't even see the people who were firing on them. But then it's worse. Their humiliation continues. Because as they're being fired on, British officers recalled that they could hear colonists crying out, King Hancock forever. Wow. So they had taken this nickname, this put down, and literally appropriated it and made it a rallying cry. Hancock had been in Lexington just a few hours before the battle breaks out, bre breaks out excuse me, but he takes off on his way to Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress. He loved the ride. He got so much attention. All of the delegates, Massachusetts was traveling with the delegates from Connecticut as well. And as they arrived to New York, Hancock reported that he saw over 7,000 men on the left of his carriage, on the right of his carriage. They kicked up this dust ball that delighted him. And they offered even to unhook his carriage and walk him into the streets of New York City. The reception clearly means a lot to Hancock. Over half of his letter to his fiance at the time, Dorothy, popularly called Dolly, so that's, I'm gonna refer to her as Dolly. Over half of his letter to Dolly describes this scene. Then once he's inside New York City, guess where he goes next, right where we're sitting. He says, we entered the city, so 
I'm going to, I'm going to have it transcribed for you in a second, but just to show you, um, part of the letter, he says, Francis is, um, we entered the city through the principal streets of New York amidst the declarations of thousands, uh, through the principal streets of New York's and amidst the declarations of thousands, we were set down at Mr. Francis's after entering the house, three huzzas were given. Silas Dean, a delegate from Connecticut, also noted that they dined here. He says, we dine, et cetera. That et cetera is drinking, by the way. Uh, we dine, et cetera, at Francis's, but lodge at separate houses. And then for those of you online who maybe haven't seen a picture of Francis Tavern, here we have it. Um, the delegates continued to from New York City to Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress. And they ate and drank and stayed in taverns there. But as the fighting continued, Hancock's entertaining becomes more difficult because of wartime shortages. He still craved wine and found it very distressing that he could not um, drink it himself or entertain the way he once did. He asked his friend if he could, quote, spare me a little Madeira. And he said, I feel awkward not to have it in my power to ask a friend to take a glass. By the way, this is months before, just months before the devastating winter at Valley Forge for the Continental Army. So we are talking about a very um, different um, man and world than those that were doing the fighting. Hancock thought war should not stop his entertaining. And this opens him up to criticism, but his fine hosting pays off in 1778. So I have to give you a little bit of backstory to understand the importance. This time he's not entertaining George Hughes or mob participants, but French aristocrats. The French Navy was staying in Boston for several months and just a little bit before their arrival, this, the alliance with France and the United States was secured. You might think that some in the United States would be thrilled to have this formidable help, but those in Boston were at best suspicious of the French, but mostly hated the French. There's a couple of reasons for this. The first is Great Britain and France had been warring for nearly a century in North America. And now France is allying with the colonists to take on Great Britain. Proportionally, in the previous the war the previous decade, the French and Indian War that ended in 1763, excuse me, Massachusetts had sent more soldiers proportionally than any other colony. So they have this, just a decade earlier, they were fighting against the French. And so to expect them to turn around and now be ready to be um, so glad for their partnership, it was unrealistic. Much of the Hancock fortune, in fact, had been made supplying provisions to the British army to take on the French. Paul Revere distrusted the French, and he was half French. Uh, his dad was named Apollos Rivoir, and he had immigrated from France to North America because he was a Huguenot, a French Catholic, and he feared the violent persecution that Louis XIV was inflicting on Catholics at the time. He later anglicizes Apollos Revoir to Paul Revere. But listen to what Paul Revere says. He says, I was as much prejudiced against them, but acknowledges that that prejudice arose from our connection with Britain. Another reason for Massachusetts to be suspicious of France was because most of the country's inhabitants were Catholic. Massachusetts had been founded by Puritans who literally wanted to purify the Anglican church from which rituals they found to Catholic. They found Catholics, they were quite suspicious of Catholics because they found them to be ultimately more, or they worried that they were ultimately more loyal to the Pope than to the state. The Pope drew particular ire, especially in Boston. Every November 5th, there was something called Pope's Day in Boston. When two rival street gangs would um, make these elaborate floats and <laughs> the goal was to capture each other's Pope and destroy it. Uh, this is the Pope. You can see he's got some grotesque figures here. And um, then the devil is behind him. And that was a common 
that was common imagery at this time, that wherever the Pope was, the devil would be very close behind. So Benjamin Franklin, a Boston native, was also nervous about the way that Boston may or may not receive the French. Listen to what he says. Every means should be used to cultivate the friendship, the, this new friendship, and wear off ancient prejudices. I find our common people and sailors are might ready to resume them. This tension was the backdrop against which the French Navy comes to stay in Boston for several months. Further, further reminder that there is a war going on, and so there are scant resources. You'll recall that during that there were wartime shortages, but just to get an even better sense of what's happening specifically in Boston, just before the French arrived, there had been food riots against uh, people rioted against merchants they believed were hoarding goods. One of those mobs was comprised entirely of women who took on a merchant store who they believed was um, price gouging. Here is where Hancock knew he could shine. Hancock had a gift for connecting with people, and he had such a big social influence. So he, he could help bridge this divide with the French and the Bostonians. He stepped in and did what he did best, which was entertain. He was the closest thing to an aristocrat in Massachusetts, which the French aristocrats, that is the officers would appreciate. Just look at him. And boy, he wants you to look at him. So let's take it in. He's got gilded clothing. That is not customary at the time. That is a sign of true luxury, as is the powdered wig and the silk stockings. That would be um, very familiar to, to the French naval officers. Hancock also either, he either had no prejudice against the French or was savvy enough to compartmentalize it. So he begins entertaining at home, at his home and in taverns. He hosts a grand ball and pays an enormous sum of money to ensure the French are entertained. The Comte d'Estaing, he's the French admiral, was a frequent visitor at Hancock's mansion. He tests Hancock's goodwill and generosity pretty early on. His first visit, Hancock had invited the Comte de Stang and 30 men for breakfast. But when Hancock looked down Beacon Hill from his mansion, he saw 120 additional party crushers coming up the hill. He calls to his wife, Dolly, to help get more food. But again, this is during wartime shortages. So Dolly goes to nearby neighbors asking if they can spare any cake. As much cake as she could acquire was gobbled up. She said that she couldn't even place the cake down before the midshipmen pounced on it and ate it. Uh, the servants were sent out to Boston Common to milk the cows. These are not communal cows, but they were not troubled by this. They just milked the cows. And uh, the, French, the French sailors also helped themselves to Hancock's plentiful orchards, wiping them clean. As a, uh, but... Hancock is clearly using resources that could that might have been used for other people. And so he is criticized for entertaining the French the way he did. Hancock understood, however, what others didn't. The French alliance was crucial to the United States and entertaining these aristocrats in a way that was comfortable for them would calm some of these prejudices between the French and the colonists and would demonstrate to Bostonians how to treat the French. The Comte d'Estaing concluded of his host, I have named the Honorable General Han John Hancock a patron of the French. He became one and he served as one during our stay in Boston. Hancock helped secure the alliance that became crucial to winning the Revolutionary War. Let's just look to powdered hair, gilded clothing. If you recall the picture of Paul Revere, for example, unpowdered hair, no detail on his clothing. So this would be Hancock's type of person. Hancock was criticized again for hosting another group of people in the early 1790s. This time, it was Black women and men. He had invited them over to his house in the name of, quote, liberty and equality, and this angered a lot of people. This event was derisively called the Equality Ball. This cartoon comes several years after the event, and you see Hancock here on the left, clasping hands with a black man on the right. And underneath there's a 
little phrase where Cuffy, the black man, is thanking Hancock for um, for entertaining black men and that black men appreciate Hancock's efforts. The supposed humor in this cartoon lay in the way that the black women and men are dressed. They are dressed in a genteel manner. They're dressing in a way and dancing in a way that was typical for white women and men at this time. So this is all supposed to look like a farce. Now, this event is interesting for a couple of reasons. First, Hancock's family benefited from slavery for decades before Hancock eventually emancipated the enslaved men and women in the late 1770s. And then here he is entertaining black women and men in his home, some of whom may have also been previously enslaved. Secondly, it's difficult to imagine any but any politician at this time inviting black women and men into his home, but especially in the name of equality. Politicians might have opposed slavery, and some did in Massachusetts, but that did not mean they believed in the equality among races. Of course, hosting a ball did not make the black women and men in Boston equal, whether legally or even just in their treatment. Yet in a very small way, Hancock was trying to lead by example. He hoped others might take their cues from how he treated an oppressed or marginalized group. He had done something similar with the French military, a group vastly more privileged, but who Bostonians were also openly prejudiced towards. And again, he had done this when he entertained the mobs in his home and in taverns. Hancock did not influence with newspaper articles, laws, or political tracts the way other politicians might. He had no gift for that, but he knew how to throw a party. Questions? Everybody, uh, we have uh, have for Q and A. Uh, I asked just uh, for you to uh, wait for the mic to come to you, and uh, we'll start here. And uh, we all have some questions online. Okay. Uh, anybody? Uh, sure. Uh, if I could ask you to repeat the question. Oh yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi. You were talking about how the French were uh, in the Midwest, but. Weren't the British occupying Boston? Uh, so the question is, weren't the French were in Boston, but weren't the British occupying Boston? The British occupation ended in 1776 with popularly known as Evacuation Day in Boston. Um, George Washington had taken over as general of the Continental Army, and he placed cannon on Dorchester Heights and essentially forced the British out. General Howe uh, left on March 17th, 1776. So that is known, that is also St. Patrick's Day, by the way, and um, that is known in Boston by some as Evacuation Day. Peter. You made a couple of references to Fonce's Tavern, John Hancock eating there, but another individual eating there. I, I just, where can we find them in the book? Um, so the question is, where can you find Hancock and Silas Dean in the book? in the book? Well, specifically in the context of Frost. Yeah. Oh, I don't mention the, you're not going to find it in the book. I just mentioned that they came through New York. Okay, thank you. This is the insider info you only get in person and online. Uh, speaking of which, uh, question, uh, was the tar and feathering of Richard witnessed by John Adams? Um, and uh, he seemed appalled by the tar and feathering and other things he's seen in bed. So the question is, do I repeat it for online too? Okay. The question is, Was did John Adams vit witness the Richards tarring and feathering and that Adams seemed appalled? Tarring and feathering is, is, we can kind of think of it as sort of funny today, but it's a really barbaric practice. And um, so it, it, it wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't that popular among some because it was seen as a really cruel thing to do. Whether or not John Adams was at the Richardson's, uh, at the Richards tarring and feathering, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I used to live in Boston, so I know all, a lot of its history. But is it true that the State House Annex, when it was built, it demolished the uh, Hancock House? So the question, thank you for your question. The question is the, the Massachusetts State House Annex, did they demolish the Hancock Mansion? 
Yes, but not for the state house. It wasn't exactly a through line. So I explore the demolition of Hancock's mansion in the epilogue and the legacy of Hancock because uh, the house, Hancock didn't have any surviving heirs. And so it went to relatives increasingly more distant and they wanted to sell the house to the city of Boston or the state of Massachusetts and said, just pick it up and move it if you want to move it somewhere else, but we'll give it to you. Um, and ultimately that didn't happen. The land was bought by developers who knocked it down and built townhouses. And then, and then a few years later, the state bought it. And now that's the West wing of the Massachusetts state house. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's really only this sad little plaque on the state house gates today that said, here stood the mansion of John Hancock, but more significantly, and this is what I, I get into more in the epilogue is that. Um, it started, the, the demolition of Hancock's mansion sparked a preservation movement. So federal and state protection of landmarks didn't exist until the early 20th century. So anytime you wanted to preserve something, that was work done by private citizens. And those in Boston were stunned that Hancock's house could be demolished. This very popular governor and um, known for his signature, and so it prompted others to um, rally and save similar buildings. Um, if you live, have lived in Boston or visit Boston, there's something called the Freedom Trail. I give tours on that. Come see us. We drink on the tour. Um, but some of the buildings on the Freedom Trail exist simply because private citizens decided they cared. It's, it's really... Um, inspirational in some ways. The Paul Revere House is an example of that. And the Old South Meeting House are examples of private citizens banding together to save buildings that otherwise would have been demolished. And just to begin just making um, so how did John Hancock obtain his wealth? So the question is, how did John Hancock in, in, um, get his wealth? So the short answer is he inherited it. And that's People usually groan when I say that. Um, and so the long answer is that he inherits it from his uncle, who was a self-made man. Interestingly, John Hancock comes from a line of, he's the third John Hancock, and both his father and grandfather were ministers. And so certainly the third John Hancock would go on to be a minister. But when his uncle, uh, when his dad dies, when he's seven and he goes to live with his uncle, his life changes. But what's really interesting about his uncle Thomas is he was the middle boy of three and the eldest and youngest went on to Harvard, but the parents couldn't afford to also send Thomas. So they apprenticed him to Boston, um, to a bookseller. And then he goes on to create this massive fortune. So he was a merchant. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, questions coming in from mine. I'm going to try to combine a couple. Um, uh, how old was Hancock, uh, uh, Hancock uh, during these pivotal times, such as the Tea Party and Equality Ball? And uh, did the Hancocks have any children to leave their business to? So how old was Hancock kind of at these times and they have children? So Hancock was born in 1737. So doing the math, he dies young. He dies at the age of 56 in 1793. And some people popularly think everyone died at, at in their 40s or 50s at this time, but it, it really, there was a much longer lifespan than we popularly remember. 56 was very young. Uh, for example, John Adams and Samuel Adams live into their 80s. So he is 39 when he signs the Declaration of Independence, if that sort of helps um, with his age at these times. And then they had to, he and Dolly had two children and neither live past the age of 10. And so, and that was it. And that's unusual to, to simply have two children. So no heirs. Yes. What did uh, John Hancock think about Alexander Hamilton? Not much. So, um, so in, in that Hi, online. Uh, the question was, what did Hancock think of Hamilton? Not much. And I, that wasn't meant um, as a put down. It's that they really didn't overlap at all. Um, Hamilton is so young compared to Hancock and some of these other um, founders. And uh, by the time Hamilton rises, Hancock is literally declining. Um, Hancock doesn't have 
we could talk about it or not. I, I talk about it in the book, but when he leaves as president of the Second Continental Congress, he doesn't know it, but that's the highest national office that he'll ever achieve. And so when he leaves the Second Continental Congress in the 1770s, he doesn't really again enter the national stage. There was some talk of him being named vice president or even president when the Constitution ratification conventions were happening, but otherwise um, he, he's really not on the national stage and that's when Hamilton really is. The question is, where is John Hancock buried? Yeah, so he's buried. No, that's not morbid. He's buried in, um, what? Yeah, no, so he's buried in Boston um, in the same graveyard. It's called the Granary Burying Ground as Paul Revere and Samuel Adams. Um, in addition to some other, Robert Treat Payne, who was also a delegate who rode with them um, down to the Second Continental Congress. So it's a, a real powerhouse of revolutionaries in downtown Boston. Um, Hancock is the only man in that graveyard with his face engraved on the obelisk marking his tomb, which would fit him perfectly. It was put up a century after he died by the Massachusetts legislature. So you can't miss Hancock from downtown Boston. I have a question. Uh, what happened to Hancock's ship Liberty uh, that was towed away from his pier? So what happened to Hancock's ship Liberty? It actually, the, the British keep it um, and they use it as a uh, patrol ship in the harbors to try, I mean, what an indignity. First, they seize a ship called Liberty and then they use it for the exact opposite reason, which was to try and catch other smugglers. Um, I'll be waiting to ask a beer related question. Do it. <laughs> Have um, some beer before you do it. Yeah. And I'm so embarrassed. I feel like I should know the answer to this, but I'll ask anybody. Were there si significant differences in the style of beer from the 1700s from the latest brew today and the style of today? That's not an embarrassing question. So the question was, are there significant differences but just between historic beer? Yes. So um, first, if you like your beer cold, that wasn't how it came in the 18th century. And if you like your beer carbonated, that wasn't how it came in the 18th century. So those two things significantly alter the taste of beer and um, the way that you might enjoy the beer. Um, people also made hard cider at the time too. That was especially in New England where apples grow plentifully. And that cider could be a pretty high alcohol by volume, higher than a beer. They also drank a lot of rum in Boston at the time. For your idea about different styles, one thing is colonists would ferment almost anything. You know, if, if they could ferment and they could drink it, they would try it. So that did mean that there were fruit flavored beers. Um, Benjamin Franklin had a recipe for spruce beer, which isn't exactly be beer that we would think of today, but they used any sorts of materials from the natural world so they could drink. You know, from where did Hancock family or his members, um, from where I know he's fourth generation uh, colonist and from you know where they settled? Uh, you know, so the question is, do I know when Hancock settled in the colonies? The the farthest trace back is very early in the 1630s, so 1634 or 35. Um, the, the eldest arrives. And I believe, don't, I don't even want to say this, uh, but I think he was a shoemaker, um, which is the reason I'm mentioning that is because George Hughes was a shoemaker. And then, you know, the great, great grandson is entertaining a shoemaker in his home. But I don't, please don't quote me on that. Yes, from England. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. That, yes, that should have been the first thing I said. Yes, from England. Uh, related, um, uh, somebody asked, did John Hancock have any Puritan ancestry? I don't know. Um, did John Hancock have any Puritan ancestry? So the, um, they, his, like I said, his the, the two generations before him were ministers. They were congregationalists. Um, Puritans meaning like maybe they're talking about Mayflower or, I mean, pilgrims with Mayflower or Puritans and the Arbella and no. 
not that direct line. Sorry, was that a did he brew? Did, did he brew? Not that we know of. Um, and neither did Samuel Adams. I'll just say that too. <laughs> um, uh, you may have heard me this earlier, but just in case, um, uh, when he looked at uh, Francis Haddon, he said it was in 1778. No. Um, if that was in a British occupation, what was the... No, so um, thank you for the chance to clarify. Anyone that heard 1778, he visited in 1775. So it was right after the battles of Lexington and Concord. He was coming down with the delegates from Massachusetts and Connecticut at that time. Thank you. Uh, let's see. And so just to that earlier question too, uh, Boston was occupied at that time, but New York yet wasn't. Um, how did you decide to pursue this book project? Hey, thanks. Um, how did I decide to pursue this book part project? So par part of it is that Americans know the name John Hancock. They know him for his signature, but few recognize how significant and popular he was to colonial politics. And, um, and I wanted to explore that. He's also a man of contradictions. He's born into middling and then becomes this wealthy man, but typically sides with the poor, uh, not just in the way he entertains, but with some of his uh, policies later on as governor. And so I thought it was time, it's been 20 years since a biography of Hancock had been written and 40 years by a scholar. And it was time to put Hancock and his uh, leadership forward again. I think that's a great question. And um, please give Brooke another round of applause. Thank you all, so, you guys, really so sincerely. Thank you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Okay. I'm taking it. Yeah, let's do a final huzzah. Thank you for that great idea, because now I can start to drink. One, two, three. Huzzah. Okay, now you have to listen to me for five minutes. <laughs> okay, do your thing, Scott. Do your thing. Uh, so, oops, sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you again, Brooke. We really appreciate it. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's lecture and like to stay up to date uh, on all our programs, you can do so by joining our mailing list at francistavernmuseum.org. Um, there's a calendar of upcoming programs and events, and I'll highlight a couple of those for you now. Um, Thursday, November 16th, uh, we have our next evening lecture, uh, Long Island City in 1776, The Revolution Comes to Queens. Uh, author Richard Melnick will chart the military, political, and cultural history of 1776 in Long Island City. On Saturday and Sunday, November 18th and 19th, we have George Washington's New York walking tour. Uh, Bruce Racond, uh, one of our licensed tour guides, will take you through the New York City uh, that George Washington would have come to know from 1776 to 1790. And uh, finally, speaking of drinking, uh, on Monday, November 20th, uh, Sons of the Revolution, the state of New York, own and operate uh, the Tavern Museum, uh, will be hosting our annual evacuation day dinner uh, downstairs in the Tavern's newly refreshed uh, Bissell Room. Uh, evacuation Day commemorates, as we've talked about, the evacuation of the British Army from New York City in 1783 after seven years of occupation. Uh, special guests will lead uh, the same 13 toasts uh, given at the first Evacuation Day dinner at Francis Tavern on November 25th, 1783. Uh, more information about November's event uh, can be found on sonsoftherevolution.org, and you can also read about it on your way out of the museum in our McEntee Gallery. Uh, thank you to those who have donated or become members of the museum. Uh, your generous support uh, helps to fulfill our mission uh, to share the history of the American Revolutionary Era with the public. Um, if you'd like to donate, uh, you can also do that at our website, francistavernmuseum.org. Once again, thank you to Brooke, and thank you for everybody for joining us on Francis Tavern Museum Lecture. Uh, we hope to see you again, uh, and for those who are interested, uh, book sales will kick off at the back of the room, and we'll also have them in our gift shop after uh, the lecture while supplies last. Thank you again. Well, one more question, yep. Uh, yes, uh, the paintings for those on site, uh, these are uh, part of our Dunsmore collection of American revolutionary art. Uh, we have one of the largest or the largest collection of Dunsmore paintings uh, in the country uh, at 47. These are only a, um, a few of them and they're also across the gallery and throughout the museum. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the food and drink. <laughs>